right. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, this is the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. And today we've got Daniel, who's going to tell us auto, all about networks of automatic market makers. So Daniel, before you share your slides, can you please tell us about yourself? Sure. Uh, so my name is Daniel Ingle. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, Brown University. Um, and my advisor is uh, Morris Hurley. Um, I gave a flash talk of this um, at the cross-train workshop and I'm just, this is kind of the full form version of, this, of the talk. So yeah. And right, thanks well, Peter for inviting me by the way. Yeah. Not a problem at all, not a problem. I'm sure this is gonna be awesome and it would have been great to have the full version for the cross-chain workshop, but there was, yeah, lots of um, competing talks to try mm -hmm. and ram into one um, conference. So please present your slides. All right. All right, you can see it okay? Yes. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so um, um, like Peter said, so the title of this is Networks of Automated Market Makers. Um, I, first off, uh, I'll go into a bit of a talk overview later, but I wanna provide a little, I wanna contextualize this, our work uh, first. So um, as many of you probably know, um, there are lots of traditional kind of financial primitive, primitives um, that um, have been taken in, into the decentralized space. Uh, I'm calling this, or people are calling this the De DeFi ecosystem. So you have uh, financial derivatives, payment things like payment networks, stable tokens, insurance, uh, exchanges, prediction markets. There's a, there's a lot of different things going on. Um, our work is interested in unifying a lot of the core ideas that uh, exist in exchanges and uh, kind of trying to make one framework that captures the characteristics across all the different uh, projects and uh, can reasonably talk about a way to kind of uh, glue these different uh, um, exchanges together in meaningful ways. Um, so our motivation, you know, for these were market makers that exist already out in the wild, um, things like Uniswap, uh, originally for managing two assets and um, Balancer, um, is you know an instance of a market maker that manages that can manage more than two assets, uh, but it, it's just concrete instances of these sort of higher dimensional uh, market makers that manage multiple assets. Um, okay, so I'm going to go over some properties that we kind of take as uh, a definition for what an automated market maker is, um, and there are kind of equivalent formulations uh, like these constant function market makers. There's like kind of differing terminology, but they're, I think they're effectively the same. We use our definition because uh, it's very useful to use ours. We're talking about composition, which is kind of the most interesting thing that we're uh, talking about right now. Um, so um, starting out with Uniswap, um, I'm using this as kind of a motivating example for the types of properties we want to take as kind of axioms for, uh, for our definition for an automated market maker. So the important, so, so um, for Uniswap, um, just as a refresher, um, the way it works, the way a trader interacts with Uniswap is if this initial state is X naught, F of X naught, um, the trader will lose some amount of asset X that they wanna trade say it's delta x that they deposit, um, and then they withdraw some amount, which is given by this function f of x. Uh, there's a particular f of x for Uniswap, which is this k over x, but it, uh, basically they just get the difference of the function uh, in asset y. Um, uh, that's kind of, uh, I'm neglecting fees here. I'm giving a simplifying kind of example, just so it's really clear how a trader interacts. Um, um, the important, really the important parts out of this is you could choose, there's a lot of different functions you could choose. Um, you know, Uniswap's just one of them. The, the core properties that really matter are the fact that this is a nonlinear function. Uh, if it was a linear function, then you could, uh, and the exchange rate didn't change at each point, then you could drain the reserves, um, which is not really something that's desirable since these things are supposed to be providing li liquidity. Um, also, it's a smooth function. Um, you know, it doesn't maybe have to be, it, a couple of derivatives exist. So you have a kind of a well-defined exchange rate and exchange rate very smoothly. It also captures any exchange rate that could happen in the market. Um, and it's also a convex function. These are all kind of interesting characteristics that Uniswap has. And uh, we wanna make sure that any definition we have captures these properties. 
Uh, as a reminder, so a convex function just means that the line between any two points just lies above the, the function. And a convex set is a set where any two points, the line segment between those two points is contained in the set. And the main result from convex analysis that links these things together is that the epigraph of a convex function is a convex set and, and vice versa. You can kind of go back and forth between these two representations, but this is useful when we want to generalize uh, the definition to kind of uh, arbitrary number of assets. Uh, so just to give an example of what happens when your function is not convex, um, uh, is if you if you have a non-convex function, you can basically, if you had an, uh, access to an external market uh, that had a fixed exchange rate and you were interacting with an AMM, if, if the AMM was non-convex, then you could you you could make um, a positive risk-free profit and and as you increase the amount you would deposit in the AMM, you could you could increase that profit. So you would be incentivized to basically drain the reserves, um, which is not really something again we want for uh, something uh, for a market maker that's supposed to um, provide liquidity. So that's sort of tries to, this is try to, trying to illustrate that the convexity is kind of essential. Um, so when, instead of, so we have this uh, description using this kind of explicit function, you can write um, f of x uh, as a function, or y as a function of f of x, but when you go to higher dimensions, it's a little bit more cumbersome to use that uh, way of defining an AMM. It's, um, easier to work with a, another uh, way of describing them. Uh, instead of writing, uh, you know, X is a function of Y or Y is a function of X, it's easier to use a constraint function. So you say, um, you just want to write a constraint that describes the surface or the curve. Uh, this is nice because you don't really have, like I kind of mentioned, you don't have privileged assets in the sense that you don't have to write one, um, that you don't have to write the state in, uh, Y in terms of X, an explicit function. You write it, you use an implicit function. Um, so for Uniswap, the example would be, this is the constraint function you use uh, that's equivalent. And you just, the, the um, way you describe this curve is just by setting this constraint function equal to zero. It's just the level set of the um, constraint. And I'm just introducing a little bit of notation here. Um, I'll let S be the set of, of set of X's. This is just some shorthand, but it says, it's the set of points where the constraint is less than or equal to zero. And then the boundary is the, the set where the constraint is equal to zero. Um, so, um, you can kind of maybe see intuitively like, well, if we had this thing property that said that the original for, for the other representation, if we said that the function had to be convex, then we're going to demand that this upper set, the set where the, the set S is convex. Uh, it's sort of equivalent. You can kind of go back and forth between the two representations, but it's, again, um, it's for, for the constraint representation, it's just easier to use this uh, way of talking about it. Um, so this using this constraint, you can just say, okay, instead of managing uh, two assets, I want it to be something that uh, I'm, I'm talking about uh, AMMs over n plus one assets. And again, you just this constraint function goes from n, n plus one uh, dimensions to just the real numbers, and you you define s and delta s similarly. Um, so, and the properties you want out of these constraints are uh, kind of a similar version of convexity. Namely, you want the uh, well, let me, um, you want convex, you want it to be convex to carry over from the, the explicit function properties. You want it to be kind of increasing, which intuitively corresponds to uh, increases in liquidity in the AMM. Um, and that function, uh, if you increase the reserves, the function increases correspondingly. And then uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk about flexibility and stability. It's a little bit more uh, detailed, but uh, pick, you know, um, geometrically, you're, you want this upper set to be convex. That's what convexity really means. It's actually it, technically it's strict convexity. It's it's actually it's a little stronger, but uh, that's it's a form of convexity. Um, you want it, this function to be increasing. So as you increase any one of its arguments, this um, constraint function uh, increases its value. Um, and then this flexibility stability property. This is kind of a, an important property that uh, you would demand because uh, you want. It basically says if if you choose any exchange rate, um, which for a two asset AMM, that would be a point on a line segment. You choose an exchange rate, there's a corresponding point on the AMM curve that um, achieves that exchange rate. Um, uh, that's, that's flexibility, uh, that's, that's what we call it. Um, but you know, in higher dimensions, uh, exchange, it doesn't make sense necessarily to talk about an exchange rate. So we say, okay, you have a valuation, which is you know, for three assets, it's a point on the interior of a triangle. So, and in higher dimensions, it's on the interior of a simplex. It just says for any possible um, 
sort of ratios between assets that you think is the current uh, true ratio, we have a corresponding point, um, which is basically like a exchange rate. Um, you can think of it as an exchange rate. And in stability, uh, so this so flexibility says you know for any for any point I can find for any exchange rate I can find you a point. It's an important property to have because for people uh, one of the, the the claims of these AMMs is that they sort of uh, they track the market rate and the reason they really do that is because of this property. It's because um, when someone's performing arbitrage, the best state for them if they believe the valuation is V, the best state for them to push the AMM into is the um, state that has the um, that where V is, you know, where basically they can maximize their profit, which is the corresponding uh, stable state for this point. It's just the, it's the, yeah. Uh, so th this, uh, the, the, the fact that there exists sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between exchange rates and um, points on the surface is uh, kind of necessary in order for it to have this property of tracking uh, uh, exchange rates. Um, okay. So that's just gives a little bit of language to talk about. Uh, to, so we're on the same page about what I mean by an AMM, uh, at least for our purposes. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, now. I'm going to talk about um, composition, uh, which is. Uh, so I, I want to kind of preface this by motivating composition Daniel? a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Would you be happy to pause for a second, take a few questions? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I think. Um, C. Chen, do you want to um, fire your question through? Is this on in the chat or? Yes, can I just ask it? Um, oh, sure. By voice then? And I'll, I'll turn on. And I certainly do. Real yeah. person. Go um, for it. So I, how do you account for discontinuous price movements um, or non-normal price distributions and returns that you see in, in actual Financial assets. Um, so, are you are you talking about like if the it, so we're saying that there's an external market where the, the are you saying we're not modeling the external market where the exchange rates fluctuating? Is that what you're talking about? Or yeah, so I mean, when you actually look at two real world currencies that trade with each other, you see long periods um, of normal distribution returns, and they move mathematically, as you've said. And then um, once in a while, the price will just move, for example, a 30% drop in one day when mm -hmm. the normal distribution is half a percent to 1% is one standard deviation. And five, six standard sigma events happen much more commonly than the normal distribution would occur. And this happens because the information in the market just undergoes sudden changes, for example, countries impose um, exchange controls or currency controls um, or the assets that are backing them suddenly lose value. Just things happen in the real world that cause these re total regime shifts in the values of different assets relative to each other. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, we're not really saying we, we're not making any assumptions about how that, um, uh, you're, you're calling it, I guess, price movement, or you can think of it as an exchange rate, how it's changing. We're just saying, well, if it changes, we want to make sure that um, you know these rational profit maximizing agents can come in and, and adapt the state accordingly to whatever happened in the outside market. So you know maybe it fluctuates very rapidly, maybe it doesn't. But the point is, uh, we would want an AMM to be able to handle any of those situations and be able to move to a corresponding state for whatever outside activity happened. Does that make sense? Um... Ideally, yes, I, I know that's what we would like to do, but in your formula, you have like this function of price and volume and exchange rate, but at some point, like it just moves so far um, on your, um, on that function, mm -hmm. on your convex function, or like this kind of a price movement it is not something like how much do you charge for the liquidity, for providing liquidity, or do you want to even- that Convex be available to provide it's convex. It, it penalizes you if you move very far out. Yeah, it's convex, so you get sort of diminishing returns if you if you move farther out from kind of the the where they're closer to one to one exchange rate. Um, yeah, right. But, but I think what what you're saying, um, see, Chen, is that um, if you have regulatory risk, so the government changes the rules. 
I don't know, there's an earthquake. Something happens. Some, some stuff happens. Happen. But then COVID. Yeah, yeah, COVID. But then you will suddenly you will still be on the curve, but you're just going to slide a long way off the curve. And essentially, you're going to, as Sly was just saying, you essentially because of the convex nature, you essentially get penalised um, for that. So I guess you could still run out of liquidity in theory. So I suppose that's a better question. What happens when it does run out of liquidity? I mean, it technically can't if you use even something like the constant product because it's, uh, you know, you're asymptotically approaching uh, oh, zero. So but it'll you never just get it. smaller and smaller and smaller until you right. hit the, the limit of whatever your a floating point precision is. or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> until it hits one Satoshi in Bitcoin or whatever in, in, in Ethereum, whatever the limit is, unless you hit that, it can always move the price in a convex manner. Mm. So, mm. yeah. 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 All right. Look, I think this has been a great um, intermission okay. conversation. Um, Thank you. But I, I, I suggest um, keeping on going. I think that that's been uh, certainly got everyone to wake up and have a think about where we're actually at. And I think that's good. So please talk about AMM composition because I'm keen to hear. Okay. Okay. So uh, so I'm going to start out with a simple case. Um, just to kind of, mo yeah, I want to motivate this by saying we're trying to model the, the way a if a trader is faced with a network of AMMs, they might try very kind of exotic behaviors. You know, they might uh, trade with one and then take what they get out of that one and another one and, then, and, and do interesting things. But we're saying, okay, what are some sort of simple types of trading strategies a trader might do? And um, so we're proposing a, a, you know, a couple, a couple different ones that make sense. So one is, I'm calling it a simple case. It's, you know, imagine, we call it sequential composition. Imagine a trader has there's some network of AMMs um, and you know they might be on the same blockchain or different or maybe it, this is this whole conversation is sort of agnostic to what's really happening on the on the underlying blockchains it's just understanding how these AMMs interact with each other so if you have say a trader who interacts with call this asset A uh, call this asset B and call this asset C maybe they want to trade A for C but there's no AMM that can do that deal for them so they'll say, okay, maybe I can go through two AMMs. One, maybe I can go from one that trades me A to B and B to C. Um, the thing we were wondering initially was, well, uh, if we effectively, we don't really care about what's happening internally with the middle asset. Um, we just really care about what the behavior is when you do this kind of operation uh, for what they put in and what they get out. Uh, and so we were wondering, does this also behave like an AMM? Can we just think of like the sequential composition as uh, in, in terms of the underlying state spaces, can we think of it as just uh, one big AMM that I'm trading with? And um, if you, I'm, I'm going to put a, a little bit of math on the screen, but it, it doesn't really matter. I'm just putting it here just to be a little more concrete. If you if you write down the sort of the obvious thing, if you say I have delta x of asset x, and I I trade with this AMM, and this is how much I get back, I get delta y back. It's just the difference of uh, these two points on the function. And then I take that delta y and I stick it into another AMM, I'll get delta z. If I just kind of follow my nose and replace these symbols in the right way, I can define a function h of x that um, satisfies actually all our, all our AMM axioms. And uh, you can really think of this sequential trading as just putting in delta x and you're getting out the delta z and you don't care about what happens with the delta y's in the middle. It doesn't really matter. Um, so the point is that you, know, you can define sequential composition in this uh, special case um, and it's well-defined and it satisfies the AMM axioms that we have. So it's like, you can effectively think of it as another AMM. You can kind of collapse that whole sequence of trades to um, just one, as if you're trading with one. Um, a similar type of operation you might do is, uh, it's kind of orthogonal uh, conceptually to the other one, is like you have multiple AMMs that govern the same assets, but maybe some, because of the current state they're in, they, they're a better deal for you. So you have asset maybe A and B, uh, or you want to trade A for B, but one AMM offers a better deal. So you have some amount and you split it between the two. Uh, maybe as you trade with one, you get a better deal, but then it changes and the other one gives you a better deal. So you split your uh, trade accordingly. And if you kind of open up these uh, boxes, you get something similar to the previous one, but it, th the way it's defined is it's parameterized by this fraction that you choose to split between the first AMM. So if you have delta X that you want to trade of asset X, you split T delta X in the first one and one minus T delta X in the second one. And then you do the trade uh, for both of them. So you did the trade with the first one and the trade with the second one. Uh, and then you just add, your profit is just the sum of these two boxes. And in a similar way, you can write down a function H that depends on T, uh, how much you choose to split. Um, 
that effectively, you know, you put in delta x into it, and it, it gives you uh, delta y of this, um, uh, the profit you get from the trading with these two AMMs. But it, it also satisfies the axioms we have. It's like, you know, you can do this parallel composition, and you're effectively trading with this sort of, you can think of it from the standpoint of a trader as trading with just another one big AMM again. It, um, the composition just gives you back another uh, AMM. So, uh, okay, so that's kind of, uh, that was our starting point. We're like, wow, this is cool. You know, you can effectively think of like arbitrarily long chains of trades as just trading with one big AMM and parallel trades too. So, but, but there, that, that's great if you have AMMs that uh, manage like two assets each, but uh, it's a little trickier to define composition in higher dimensions when you have, um, when they're managing more than, at or they're managing at least three assets basically. And I'll kind of, uh, explain uh, why. Um, but, we, but, but in order to, um, to talk about sequential and parallel composition in higher dimensions, we have to introduce other operations that make it easier to sort of uh, wrangle with the, the higher dimensions and uh, simplify some of the analysis. Uh, yes, there are. So I'm just responding to the question. There are other operations which I'm about to show, which, yeah, we use to define sequential and parallel and, and higher dimensions. So. Okay, so the first thing we do is projection. This is an operation which um, con conceptually is uh, pretty simple. You say, say I have uh, maybe an, an AMM that manages more than uh, three or more assets. Um, and maybe I wanna trade, uh, say, call this asset A, B, and C. Say I wanna trade asset A for B and I don't actually care about C. Um, it would, you know, one of the things we want to, that seems kind of true is that if, if you don't care about C, then you really should just, uh, from the standpoint of the trader, again, it, it, it seems like you're just eff effectively interacting with an AMM that allows you to just trade for A and B. It's just a two asset one. Um, this operation is projection, which just means you basically are ignoring some subset of assets and you just trade with the other ones that are left over. And so you, um, when you project, you just uh, get back a new AMM that just removes those assets. And uh, geometrically, what this means is, say you have, um, you know, say this uh, this surface corresponds to um, uh, an AMM, and you fix different reserve values of z. For each of those values, you get a level set of this function that corresponds to one of these curves on the right. And those they seem like they should satisfy all the you know AMM properties. They have this convexity and the smoothness and everything. It's and they do, uh, but it's it's you know it's it seems kind of obvious maybe, but it's still a useful. Um, operation um, just because it simplifies a lot of things. And it, it, it allows us to express higher dimensional composition more easily by just having this kind of thing in our toolbox. Um, so it satisfies a couple of nice properties, which you might expect. But if you take an AMM and you project it, so you just forget about some of the assets, the thing you get back is still an AMM. Um, the state space is the projected state space, meaning like you just forget about, once you fix the assets you don't care about, um, you just you basically have the other variables left and that's the projected state space. And another important property, which we want is if your AMM original one is at a stable point with respect to a exchange rate evaluation, then when you project, uh, it's still, the, the corresponding point is still stable with respect to evaluation that we, we, can, we can write down. It's not, it's related to the original valuation. So you know exactly what the corresponding um, rate uh, uh, the, the new state is um, corresponds to once you do the projection. So we kind of understand what the operation is doing in that sense. Um, okay. Another operation, which is a little bit more uh, complicated, but uh, I guess necessary for us is this AMM virtualization operation. So, um, okay. So, okay, okay there we go. Um, so the idea is, again, you're faced with something like uh, a situation like this where you maybe have uh, three or more assets. Um, but the problem is, is that if you choose, we, if we want to describe a trader, we want to know kind of, they put something in, in the early examples, they get, if there was one asset going out, they put some amount in, they'll get some deterministic amount out. But in this case, if you put some amount in to this AMM, you're, it's unclear how much of the corresponding uh, other two assets you'll get out. It's, um, there's, there's still a degree of freedom left. Um, by just specifying your input, you have not, you still have one degree of freedom. And so 
we need some way of reducing the number of degrees of freedom and and uh, to kind of define this. So uh, what we do is we say, okay, well, imagine that um, each of these, the trader in their mind has some uh, way of relating these two currencies. The um, via he, maybe the trader thinks that one of the currencies is two times as valuable as the other one, say. So they have sort of an, a relative exchange rate in their mind of the two currencies. Um, so the idea is we want to represent both of these as a new token, sort of like a virtual uh, token, which um, is uh, a representation of uh, maybe two thirds of one of the assets and one third of the other one. It sort of pegs them to a fixed value uh, based on their current or the current belief of the exchange rate between those assets. So what that allows us to do is to basically say, okay, if we want to understand um, trading in this complicated case, well, we can actually do this virtualization thing and we can just model these multiple tokens. We can just reduce them to one uh, sort of virtual token. Um, and that can simplify how we would define composition in higher, in higher dimensions. Um, so kind of, uh, I mean, roughly virtualization is a little messy, uh, but geometrically what you're doing is you're saying, say we have this you know, exchange rate again, uh, we wanna find a point on the AMM that corresponds to um, so, such that the ratios between all the reserves at that point uh, are some scalar um, multiple of the exchange rate or valuation, uh, and that and that scalar multiple is kind of re it's related to the way that we define the virtual value uh, based on the valuation or the, vir the the virtual amount of currency um, corresponding to the other uh, reserves for the, the things that we virtualize. Um, so. Virtualization has similar nice properties to projection. When you virtualize, uh, you get back an AMM. So you fix some set of assets and you say, I want to collapse them down to one asset. Uh, you'll get back um, another AMM. Um, and effectively what you're doing is you're like pegging the bundle of assets that you're reducing. Uh, you have an exchange rate in mind. So you're like, you're pegging them down to uh, a fixed asset that represents proportions of all those other assets. Um, and again, we have this property, which we would hope uh, we have, which is the stability is preserved. So if the original AMM is stable, then when you project again, you can say exactly how the new AMM is stable and what um, valuation it's stable with respect to. Okay, uh, I, uh, maybe I'll stop for questions here again. So I had one question in the chat. Uh, is an implementation of virtualization possible using parallel composition or somehow related to it? So um, it, it, I mean, I, we'll use it, like I'm gonna show that we need it as a kind of a building block to define parallel composition when we have a lot of degrees of freedom. It's like a, but I don't know about the other direction. Uh, if you can sort of say that virtualization can be expressed in terms of parallel composition. Um, because it's it's a little different. Uh, oh, yeah, my, my question is exactly about expressiveness, whether you really enrich strictly uh, the set of operations that you can, uh, or uh, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, things that you can do, or whether it's already possible using the other operations. Um, so I don't know if it, I mean, we it's it's kind of a, it feels like a, the question. So we don't really, uh, there's no other way of defining parallel composition when you have too many degrees of freedom. So to say, so it's unclear how to say it's more expressive or not, because this is the sort of working definition we're using for parallel composition. We're saying you 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 use virtualization as a building block to define it. Does, does that make sense? We, I mean, we have parallel composition in uh, the simple case. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's perfect. Okay, cool. I have a question um, sure. for regarding virtual visualization. I how how does getting that virtual token translate into being an AMM? I mean, I'm not clear on that. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, it's it's a little bit okay. So. Um, you're effectively saying, okay, say, um, you know, so with like projection, for instance, um, you, uh, 
you fix, say, so you have three assets, you fix one of them. And then if it was a surface, the new thing is a curve um, once you're projecting. Um, the idea behind virtualization is you get that curve and um, you, I mean, you're essentially collapsing. You're, you're, you're trying to find a way to determine exactly which point on that curve. You're trying to pin down that point, a point on that curve instead of uh, having the, you know, if, if you don't do that in some way, then you'll have all these degrees, you'll have a degree of freedom to move anywhere you want. So, um, I mean, you're just, what, what we're basically doing is we're choosing kind of a meaningful way of uh, reducing a bundle of assets to one fixed value. Um, and it, it's, uh, I mean, it's hard to explain intuitively why it happens to just be an AMM. It just, it, it turns out to, to work. Um, and yeah. We, we turn the two assets. Once you do the, once you apply this virtualization operation, which are the two assets that, the, that are exchanged in the resulting AMM. So if, let me go back to the, just the, yeah, I'll go back to this. So the um, actual, when we define, you know, when you define how this trade works, the thing that actually gets traded is the virtualized token. So it's as if for, you, for, sort of, yeah, go ahead. There are two assets, right? One is the virtualized token, which is the other asset. There is no other asset. That's that's kind of the point. The point is, uh, okay. we're trying. You know, this is, in the implementation. You know, this isn't wouldn't actually be happening. We're just trying to understand how a trader would behave when interacting with these. So we're saying, well, effectively, when talking about composition, maybe you know we can say, let's wrap bundle these two assets into one fake virtual asset. That's just a useful sort of mathematical object that will allow us to talk about how to do this composition. Um, but but when you do the trade, it's still this box represents one asset that is it's pegged okay. to the the it's it's meant to represent two thirds of this asset and and one third of that whatever the reserves are. It's just a way of pinning down the ratio uh, the ratio between the two that the trader thinks is uh, true. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. I think that's pretty good. I'd keep on going with the next section. Okay. So, so now uh, I'm, so, uh, okay. Let's see. Okay. So now we can talk about sort of the multi-dimensional version of sequential composition. Um, that we, we kind of split it into cases. Uh, one case is, we call it the mini to one case, where if you have, uh, Many here means many inputs to the in, at the beginning of the trade, and uh, one here means uh, the internal assets that are being traded. There's there's only one, so and, and there could be any number really of assets out here. Um, but the point is that in this case, this is kind of similar to the uh, which you could call a one to one, the earlier example, uh, and um, where each AMM has two assets being traded. Um, it's similar in the sense that once you fix, say, this AMM in this case, it trades three assets, but you know, once you fix two, you've completely determined the third point. Um, and if you had in income, or if you had in, in plus one assets in the AMM, you know, if you feed in the first in, then you've that you've exhausted your degrees of freedom. So it's complete. It's uniquely determined what this output is. So the point is that once you fix the two um, incoming assets, the outcoming assets determined how much you get back, which you then pipe into the second one, which is uniquely determined. So the point is the whole composition is uniquely determined in this um, case. So it's not so hard to generalize sequential composition for multiple incoming out, uh, assets. Um, it's not so different than the, the simpler case. Um, but when you have the many to many case, many to many meaning, you know, many incoming and many internally uh, traded assets, uh, that's, where, that's where the virtualization becomes useful. Uh, the way we define sequential composition is you, you, know, you start with, uh, something that looks like this, and we have too many degrees of freedom when we fix the incoming assets. And then you say, okay, we'll reduce the internal assets to this virtualized token. Um, and then, and, 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 and once we have that, that reduces to the many to one case. So we can now think of this effectively as uh, just being one token internally. And then we know how uh, se sequential composition is defined in that case. And, and we know in that case, again, that uh, this actually is an AMM. Uh, so it sort of is a, we're just invoking the kind of special case. We've reduced it to that case. Um, 
Yeah, so it's the point is it's well defined uh, kind of in for any number of assets, you can kind of define for, for you know any number of assets between any number of AMMs, you can define what it means to sequentially compose them. Uh, and similarly, you can define parallel composition uh, in, in higher dimensions. Uh, there's a many to one case as well. So you have many in and one out. Uh, again, once you fix the incoming assets, the outgoing ones are fixed in this case. And so it's this is kind of, again, not surprising that it would be uh, any different than in the simpler case. Uh, so you do get back an AMM again that satisfies the properties we want. Uh, and okay, in the many to many case, um, okay, in the many to many case, you might expect what we're going to do. We're going to say, okay, well, we have this AMM that uh, has too many degrees of freedom. So again, we need to virtualize the outgoing assets uh, to make it a little bit more tractable. Uh, when you do that, then you're, you're reduced back to the um, many to one case again. And in that case, we again, we know how to define uh, parallel uh, composition. So uh, we get back something that, that, that that'll be trading that, that looks effectively, but yeah, like this, you're trading the original incoming assets and then you're, you're getting back out the virtual asset. Okay, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so, for example, uh, if if you want to sell the the token which is created with multiple assets partially in in a different composition, how would you do it? So, I guess um, you. So, again, this is like a where this is a it's a mathematical convenience, you know, uh, that we're introducing to talk about composition, but. I guess in reality, you could have uh, a token. You create. You could create a, to, to, a token that represents some that could be traded at a fixed uh, amount relative to other tokens. So if you basically, it's a you know, which is maybe a little risky, but you could. So what I mean is like, say you have um, some amount of this token here, like one of this and um, two of this, then you would just. You know, you'd have a formula that takes two thirds of the reserve of X and two thirds or, and one third of the amount of Y that you have, and it would give you back that amount of um, this new token. And then the later you could would remain the same. You can, right? uh, as in the fraction would remain the same. So yeah, the fraction remains the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can't really sell one of the assets in that particular bundle. Um, so it's not possible to sell one of the assets in that particular bundle. So for example, there's X and Y, you just want to sell one third of Y's, but no one third of X, that's not possible. Yeah, once you get the, the virtual token, yeah. So, I mean, you'd have to cash it back in. Okay, um, so that- If, if you were to implement in, this, yeah. Okay, so. thank you. But I mean, I, again, this isn't like, um, it's like realistically that rate might change. So like, yeah. So you know what, I mean? what, it's... what was con what was confusing me was so so there is not only one, there's like millions of trades going on, and there could be like billions of tokens which were created. But how do you zero in on uh, the arbitrage which was going to create between this multiple there would be so many tokens in the market, right? So mm -hmm. everybody, every token has a different sort of comp composition inside itself. Right. But now being a single market, you'd be like uh, there's no fixed price ads. Everything is moving in cluster and everything is connected to one another. So how, for example, it's really dynamic from where I'm looking. So how do you zero in on the prices and arbitrage models and things like that? There's yes. so many variables coming in. Yeah, yeah. So I think this is for, this is like step one. That's the way you see it. It's like, well, you, we, okay, it's like, yes, ideally to make it realistic, we need to consider, we need the, everything to be time dependent and time to be incorporated. But the problem is we need, we were like, okay, we need to start simple and we need to start by saying, okay, how do you define composition when you don't have to worry about how things are varying in time? And then maybe you can add time in later as a next um, kind of uh, this is step. all still for like swaps and derivatives and other stuff, right? Sorry, yeah. what? This is all still for like financial derivatives and trade, like in 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 a mathematical model, not, right? You're not actually going and buying those tokens. Same as when you trade rice futures, you don't 
go and actually buy rice, right? This is, uh, I, I mean, I guess our, the underlying things that you're trading, it doesn't, this doesn't, it doesn't matter what's being traded. Um, it could be a derivative uh, token or something. It doesn't, and we're also not modeling anything about the underlying assets. We're just saying they're just values that are stored in this contract, but you actually are trading them. Uh, yeah. Right. Therefore, you, you, but you need to that the virtual token you're not basically trading. Really. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it might not make sense to actually trade it, uh, but in practice, the virtual token. But it's I, again, it's I, it's a little strange, but it's a convenient uh, sort of mathematical formalism to just talk about composition uh, more generally. Um, you know, and it does have kind of meaning uh, as an actual token. Um, So this token can have, for example, say commodities, equities, anything we want. It's just. Yeah, maybe it's good to think any... of the, oh, go ahead. No, it's just, I was adding to that. So it can have any sort of uh, composition as in could have commodities or for example, equities or example, metals, anything. Uh, so it's just between two parties that how it works out. Yeah, I, I think. Maybe think of the virtual token as a portfolio, um, okay. and the value of that token is the value of the portfolio. Effectively, I mean that's a one maybe mm -hmm. way to think of. And so but you can trade a portfolio of assets. You know, it's yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. But what was covered? It's not immutable. The token, it just right. stays as that token forever, unless you redeem it partially. Yeah, or... unless you redeem. Yeah, but it really is just a value placeholder. It doesn't really. It's meant to be. Uh, okay, come on. Sorry. Um, it's meant to be. Um, let me go back. Okay, I've lost those slides. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it's meant to just be a temporary placeholder that that's going to be traded back in eventually. Okay. Like it. Yeah. Anyways. Um, okay, so just to summarize composition uh, in its full generality, um, AMMs are closed under these definitions of composition, meaning that if you take two a any number of really of AMMs and you sequentially compose them or parallel compose them, then you get back an AMM. Um, so this is kind of a, it just kind of, it means it, it's a good verification for the fact that the definition we're taking of one of these is um, maybe the right one. Um, also, stability is preserved. So if the so this is um, something that you'd hope to be true, but you know if you have two AMMs that are in their stable state with respect to say you have uh, one that trades two assets and another that trades two assets, and the exchange rate one's at a stable point with respect to the exchange rate between X and Y, and the other one's at an exchange rate between Y and Z. Then when you compose them, um, the new AMM is at a stable point um, with respect to the exchange rate between X and Z. So the, all the stability uh, checks out. And we think this is a useful framework for talking about, um, at least from the st standpoint of traders, for talking about how they interact with networks. How, uh, it's, we think it's a starting point for how to model the behavior of a, a profit maximizing trader who wants to kind of route payments through a network of AMMs. Um, so our current work and kind of future work is, uh, so um, we want to, so composition is nice, but you know you have to in practice deal with issues of, if once you add time, it becomes much more complex because then you have to consider um, if, if the trader thought that a trade was gonna, you know, if, if the two AMMs are functioning separately, then um, the one could change independent of the other. And so the trade might, when they, when they pipe several AMMs together, say serially compose them, then or sequentially compose them, then you might not get what you expected. And so it might not behave exactly like we think it does in a simple kind of static case. So more generally, we want to look at um, when uh, AMMs um, are varying in time. So uh, that doesn't just mean the state of the AMM, that means the underlying function. Um, so for example, uh, the stable swapper kind of curve paper, you know, um, they have something that kind of looks like a constant product, but it's flatter near the, um, it's, it's meant to model a stable token. So it's flatter near uh, like 
exchange rates around one one. Um, so you can imagine um, AMMs that as trading activity happens, it uses that information to somehow adapt itself to make itself flatter to give traders better exchange rates. So we're trying to understand how changes in the AMM affect composition, uh, the actual structure of the function. Uh, okay, that's it. So any questions? Yeah, I can um, ask a question to start with. Thanks for this uh, very nice uh, presentation, Danny. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned in the last uh, slide uh, time varying, uh, let's say, functions and so on. Mm -hmm. So my question is about also modeling uh, non-determinism uh, so that you can capture, let's say, family uh, families of functions, for instance, and or even uh, beyond time uh, probabilities and so on. So is it yeah. something that down the track you, well, it, it's already very hard to, 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 to define this framework, but down the track, that's probably something that is of interest, right? Right. We're actually, I mean, we're kind of doing that right now. And yeah, we're like, okay, you know, um, if you see, you know, if the, uh, contract sees trading activity, it can kind of try to infer some distribution of future trades and it can try to learn, you know, how to adapt based on, to basically give, well, it, it can learn to adapt to the advantage of traders or the liquidity providers. And, you know, yeah. So, so yeah, that's something we're kind of looking at right now. Yeah. Short last one. Uh, there's a notion in some systems of, uh, you know, opponent or games, so which is somehow related to non-determinism, except, uh, that in a game you control some, uh, let's say, the actions, and the opponent controls some of the other ones. So that's mm -hmm. also sort of a standard way of uh, trying to find strategies to to play and to maximize. Some, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, yeah. It it is kind of uh, there is kind of a game going on under the hood between uh, traders and liquidity providers, um, and that's another thing that is kind of something we're looking at is like, uh, you know, curve flattens itself. Um, but it seems like you can't just flatten a curve somewhere uh, and be like, oh, yay, we have better exchange rates now and it doesn't hurt anyone. You, there's kind of like a no free lunch uh, result, I think, that says, no, if you flatten here, then you have to pay the price. Someone's going to end up worse off, you know, here. So, yeah, yeah, it's something else we're looking at, too. So, um, Daniel, I, this talk was really well timed because believe it or not, later today, I'm designing a multi-dimensional AMM. Oh, yeah. uh, What's the point? <laughs> as, 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 you know, as you do, you know, just back of the envelope. So if you were designing a multi-dimensional AMM, and it's a funny one, it, it's got these soft properties where um, I think there's optionality. So it's not a token-based thing. It's, you know, you, anyway, I can't, I can't really describe it because it's, we're quoting for something. But anyway, if you were designing a multi-dimensional AMM, you know, like on the back of an envelope later this afternoon or this evening for you, mm. where would you start? What would you do? I guess I, it would be useful to know what I'm, what the, if I had more information about the assets, that would give me some clue, you know? So if I like knew that, say they were stable tokens, then I would say, well, uh, like as in I could, if I had a good sense maybe of what their exchange rates have been in the past, then I could say, well, maybe I'll make something that keeps uh, its, its state is relatively flat in those regions where those exchange rates are supposed to be, you know, something like that. Um, so I would look at how those uh, tokens that it's going to be trading with have, what the relationship's been in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's helpful because these things don't currently exist and aren't traded yet, but we're creating the yeah we're creating the system such that they will be then tradable. But then mm -hmm. it's a question of what, at what rate they'll be traded. Hmm. All right. Anyway, that sounds that's a good starting point. So thank you. And um, I can see in the in the chat we do have one um, high level, very application specific one. So I'll read it out. I'm not sure that you'll be able to, you know, and if you just want to let this one go through to actually, you don't have keepers in baseball. So in a, in cricket, you have the keeper. So mm -hmm. when you're a batsman, you can just, rather than hitting a ball, you say, you, if it's not going to hit the stumps, you just let it go straight past to the keeper. So if you don't want to answer a question, you just let it go through to the keeper. So okay. is there a baseball equivalent to that? Where you well, just that's like sort a catcher. 
but but is the is the keeper on your team because uh, the catcher is often on the opposing team so yeah, yeah, the catch is on the opposing team, but the idea is you're allowed to let it just fly by and then, um, yeah, as long as it's not going to hit the stumps. So it's sort of, in other words, you, um, so to let one go through to the keeper can also in this context be, actually, I don't have a clue about that question, so we'll just let that one by. So okay. anyway, James, J J James. Yeah, I'm, 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 okay to, I'm okay to just answer it, ask it myself. Oh yeah, go for it. I can jump in here. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm probably pretty ignorant about this, but I know you, uh, Daniel, you kind of explained some properties that an AMM must have at the start. I don't know, like, is that always going to hold? And so I know that like Uniswap V3 is kind of um, having kind of different liquidity um, providing properties so that people will actually stake, or stake their liquidity against like chunks of the curve. Does it actually change any of the assumptions here or is that really just an implementation detail and the kind of curve is kind of matches these properties and all, all the kind of compositional things hold for, for what you're working. Yeah, I, I think so, you know, it's like we wrote this up and then Uniswap V3 came out, you know, like not that long ago and we we're like, oh, well, um, maybe, okay. It seems like, yes, the sort of underlying curve is still the same, but they are putting additional constraints on top of the AMM that like bounds how it can change, you know, so it can't leave a certain region or something like that. And that's still kind of okay. We could just say, Okay, some AMMs uh, put add additional structure onto them um, that maybe is to the advantage of traders or liquidity providers. But that doesn't, it's not necessary to do that. It just might be useful to do that. But it's, we sort of, the, the whole point of laying down these properties is to say, what are, what are minimally necessary properties? And you can also do, you could, you could always add more if you wanted to, but this is just what's the least you can get by with. Hey, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. And I can see Kenneth Thomas has put one in the chat too. Kenneth, do you want to talk to that? Hey there. Um, so yeah, um, the question is around like software libraries or um, just resources that are available. And I guess an example would be um, like Open Zeppelin from a smart contract development standpoint. They have a lot of tools that you can use to, you know, help accelerate and bootstrap the process so that you're not starting from zero. Um, what do we have in just, I guess, the fintech landscape that's kind of the same or that would help people accelerate and bootstrap the process, um, you know, maybe who aren't, you know, wizard coders or don't know all of the ins and outs of, like, let's just say the software pipeline. You mean for, for like, doing something like a, like chaining together two of these or something like trading between a couple of them or something like that. For, I mean, even just for, for like building out, you know, like say I wanted to start building my own and I didn't want to copy Uniswap or, you know, Pancake or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, I guess, what would be the resources that are available out there to me? Hmm. Um, I mean, I guess, as of, I mean, I guess there, are, it's like, if you write down a function that satisfies these set of rules, then you have one, you know, uh, you have an AMM that, that works. Uh, it might not be a good one, but uh, it, it, it'll, it'll do minimally what's necessary to function. Um, I yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's like, well, we'll have our paper, which I'm going to say is going to be, we've agreed that we're going to have it up by the end of the month. <laughs> uh, so um, there's that. You could look at that and see, oh, well, I just need to write down a function, make sure it, it, it satisfies the criteria and then it should work. Um, but then I know, I mean, there's just, I guess there's people on, you know, like blogs and stuff that are talking about these and uh, they have examples of AMMs, like, you, you know, that are like as an alternative Uniswap balancer or curve or something, or you could... Tweak the parameters, uh, and as long um, as you get back, uh, I, I, I guess uh, one, one way to flip flip the question is like, what exists out there to model this data or to test? Um, like, I, I don't know if there's such a thing as a Dex that's running on like Rinky B. Um, so you know, I guess what exists where you can model a curve, model a uh, potential, you know, assets that are are bonded together, um, bonded together to see how they would operate or see, you know, what numbers they would generate. You mean, uh, 
what's what's the so you're saying you have like a you have a data set and you want to construct the curve kind of in some way is that is that kind of what you're saying or um it, the the idea would be that you know i would want to take like a snapshot of numbers and then to model to 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 model curves essentially to be able to like run through different uh bonding curves to see like oh okay there might be an incentive at or for you know token holders at this amount but then not at this amount or if we have token holders at this point you know within the spectrum they may receive more of whatever you know like more equity or more of our whatever token. I see. I see. Yeah, I see. So you're trying to simulate like different market conditions and see how it, how the given AMM. Yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, there might be stuff out there. I, I wrote my own Python library and then sometimes I use Mathematica if I'm doing symbolic stuff, you know, but um, yeah, that's. Here's an, here's an idea for how you could do it. Um, if you ran a Ethereum mainnet node and you, um, just grabbed the, when you're, I mean, modified the source to say Hyperledger Besu or one of the other clients, and you sync mainnet, you grab the Uniswap um, contract and you grab the state of Uniswap at that point. And then you could um, design, you know, like essentially then have, have some analysis software that wound the state forwards and backwards through time for Uniswap. And then you could then essentially snapshot it and then run your transactions through to, you know, like try out what would happen if this happens or that happens. So essentially you grab mainnet state um, and then just, but just for that contract, and then you um, fast forward and reverse it back through essentially on a single node network. So essentially you reset up the node to be a consortium network node and you should be able to go from there. Okay, um, it's a bit of work, but you know, I think you could probably. I mean, if you were you know, so, it would take you a week or two to get, say, familiar with Hyperledger Besu code to be able to modify it around a bit, and then maybe another week or two to be able to play around and essentially see every single thing that's happened with, say, Uniswap, and then essentially snapshot it at that point, and then put in whatever transactions you want to do at that point. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Daniel, do you want to go to the next slide again? And I can quickly sure. talk about what's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, in two weeks time, Frank is going to tell us about the work on the ETH2 deposit contracts. So there, there've been all the actual verification of the incremental Merkle tree algorithm in Daphne. Um, and then a week after that, not written in this um, slide, um, there's actually going to be a recruitment event. And, you know, so it'll be a networking event. So you can come along, meet people in the ecosystem. Um, but also if you're looking for a job, um, you can, um, we'll have, maybe breakout rooms and aim to try and have one employer per breakout room so that then um, if you want to chat to people you'll be able to chat to that employer and say hey you know what I mean just talk about roles and stuff in June um, the 9th so the week after that I am going to talk about roll-ups and side chains and um, scaling and how all of that works how the various solutions relate to each other and what the security properties are and um, how it relates to ETH2, consortium chains and all the rest of that. Um, Simeon is going to talk about regulating CDBCs and um, in two weeks after that. And then two weeks after that, yet again, um, we're actually likely to have a talk on taxation of crypto, um, at least for the Australian context. And you may be able to draw analogies if you live in other jurisdictions, or um, you may not, I'm not sure. Um, but I'm, at least it'll be a good thing to see. Um, we've also got the Supply Chain and Blockchain Conference. Um, the it's free registration the call for speakers closes real soon so um, it's time to get your abstracts in for that conference um yeah so lots coming up um 
Yeah. So are there any final questions for Daniel? Not so much for Daniel, but I was just wondering about the ETH deposit contract. Would it be any deep dive into how would the migration from ETH1 to ETH2 look like? Um, sorry, could you say that again? So I'm talking about the event that's happening in May. So it's about Ethereum deposit contract, Ethereum 2. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was just wondering, would there be any intro into how a migration from the current mainnet would look like to Ethereum 2? Oh, no, um, but we have had a talk by the person who's leading that effort only, what, two or three weeks um, or two or three talks ago. Um, so um, Mikhail Kalinanen um, gave a talk on specifically the ETH1, ETH2 merge and where things were standing and the probable um, direction that's going to happen. Um, and um, yeah, so if you look at the YouTube channel for the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup, you will be able to have a look at um, the discussion about the ETH1, ETH2 merge. And um, yeah, so that that's um, well worth watching, um, especially given the merge is going to happen in either later this year or maybe first quarter of next year. That's the plan. Um, Yep, that's great stuff. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, have a great day. This talk will be up on YouTube in, I don't know, maybe 10 hours or so. Yeah. And thank you again, Daniel, for giving us a great talk. Thanks, Peter. All right. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.